Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We're very glad to, to have Peter Leonard here um, from Yale University Libraries. He's the director of the Digital Humanities Lab at Yale, definitely a very distinguished uh, library and I think also a very distinguished lab they, they have at Yale. He started in Yale in 2013 um, and was before at UCLA. Um, he received his PhD from Chicago and uh, before he was at uh, Washington, I think. And he's an expert in digital humanities, specifically also in text mining. He received the Google Digital Humanities Award in 2008 for his uh, text mining activities. And uh, he also has a link to Europe, so we're very glad to have this kind of connection because he's an expert in Swedish uh, literature. He also was a Fulbright Fellow at uh, another distinguished library. Lars, where are you? My friend and colleague Lars, I think he's here somewhere. There he is. So he was at Uppsala University for two years as a Fulbright Scholar. And so we're very excited about having you here and look forward to your talk. Peter, welcome. Thanks very much, Wolfram, and thanks to every member of Lieber for inviting me here today to a wonderful city. Det är ju underbart att vara här i Helsingfors under den härliga sommartiden. Och jag talar tyvärr bara ett av Finlands två nationella språk, så jag kommer att köra det här på mitt eget modersmål, Merkanska. I want to speak today about digital humanities and libraries, and particularly the intersection between the two, and how digital humanities might be useful to those of us who work in research libraries in accomplishing our missions. So I've titled my talk today, Digital Humanities in and of the Library. In order to speak about digital humanities in a research library context, I thought I'd begin by just making some brief points about the way digital humanities find its expression inside Yale University Library. We have, as of about a year and a half ago, a newly founded unit within Yale University Library, which we're calling the Digital Humanities Lab. And this facility is organizationally within the library. Um, our university librarian, Susan Gibbons, functions as a principal investigator. And it's also physically inside the main library, which is Sterling Memorial Library, for those of you who have been to New Haven in Connecticut. We like to think of ourselves as a service unit that provides space, community and resources to those members of the Yale scholarly community who self-identify as being interested in the digital humanities and who would like to do more. The staff of the lab, in addition to myself, includes a software developer, a user experience designer, and an outreach and engagement manager. We give out internal grants to both faculty and graduate students every year, and we also work with two postdocs who come in every academic year who work together with a member of the Yale Humanities faculty and who physically sit in the Digital Humanities Lab in the library. So part of what we've been doing in the Digital Humanities Lab is trying to the relationship between DH and the library. And one of our preliminary ideas is to focus upon two unique kinds of data that libraries are responsible for in some way. They either acquire them or they license them. They certainly steward them and they certainly feel a sense of responsibility for ensuring their preservation, and for introducing patrons to the possibilities in these collections. So I'm going to talk about two of these types of data that might be useful in thinking about the intersection of digital humanities in the library today. The first will come as no surprise to people inside the room. It's our rare and our special collections, our manuscripts, our archives, the things that we're in charge of preserving for future generations. These have been in our collections for decades, if not centuries, in the cases of many European libraries. But there's also different types of data that libraries are responsible for, and that's electronic data licensed from commercial vendors. I think at least in my institution and in probably other institutions represented in this room, this type of material consumes a growing portion of our collection development budgets. So as much as we're still buying physical books and putting them on the shelf, 
we're also increasingly licensing electronic data from commercial vendors. So the question is, can digital humanities be at all helpful in thinking about these two types of collections? And can it be helpful to libraries in terms of the responsibilities that we feel for these two very different types of data? For the case of special collections, the point I want to make today is to think about ways that we can enhance these unique archives by capturing user engagement, by not just letting people look at images passively online in digital library systems, but instead building special software affordances around these digital library systems that actually enhance the archives themselves through patrons' interactions with them. In the case of electronic data licensed from commercial vendors, we have an interest in ensuring robust researcher access to methodologies uh, described by the phrase text and data mining, even in the light of difficult licensing and copyright challenges. So I want to start just by talking about our rare and special collections and the possible intersections with digital humanities. And I want to think specifically about user engagement with archives. So I want to talk about two case studies of what we're trying uh, as part of the Digital Humanities Lab at Yale University Library. And some of these start very basic with a, a project that I'm sure many people in this room have been doing for many years, which is simple transcription. But I want to focus on the possibilities that transcription of archives can unlock when the collections themselves are extraordinarily unique, rare, and precious. And then I want to talk a little bit about moving beyond mere diplomatic transcription and towards the extraction of semantic relationships that are latent within certain types of archives and what that might mean for our ability to share linked open data. So the example I'm going to use of transcription is a relatively unique archive that's held at Yale and specifically in our Beinecke Rare Books and Manuscript Library. It's one of the world's largest collection of Cherokee manuscripts written in the Cherokee syllabary, one of the few alphabets or writing systems invented in North America around the 1820s by a Cherokee man called Sequoia, who's depicted in this painting here. We've built a software uh, environment around the Cherokee manuscripts based on work done at the University of Iowa's do-it-yourself history, but customized for the Yale environment and customized to support Cherokee transcription. This is what the site looks like, and I can actually take you through it. So here we are in what's called the Kilpatrick Collection of Cherokee Manuscripts. And you can see we have quite a number of documents, mostly handwritten in the Cherokee syllabary. And this is what they look like up close. So on the right, you have a large high-resolution image of the actual manuscript, and you can look at that very carefully. But the exciting part here is, of course, what's on the left, which is a Unicode representation of Cherokee. Um, the people who understand Cherokee well enough to transcribe it statistically don't live in New Haven, Connecticut. For historical reasons, they live in Oklahoma and North Carolina. And so building this software environment around the rare manuscripts allows people physically distant from our rare books library to contribute their unique linguistic skills towards transcribing what is in, in many cases a part of their own cultural heritage. I'll note quickly that one of the choices we made in building this software environment was to think very carefully about the fonts. As you can see, the characters on the left here are expressed in a Cherokee font, but we actually chose a new Cherokee font that had been written a couple of years ago, specifically because it was designed to try to balance the aesthetics of the Cherokee syllabary with the aesthetics of the Roman alphabet. And as you can see on this image on the screen, many of these documents are indeed in mixed writing systems, a Latin alphabet on top and the Cherokee syllabary on the bottom. So we're trying to do, uh, we're trying to do justice to the richness of the textual record here and allow people to transcribe multilingually. Now, as I said before, transcription is something that many institutions are doing. In my country alone, the Smithsonian has just launched a big project to help transcribe a lot of material in their collections. But I want to focus less on the mechanics of getting it done, although that's very important, and more about what the, what the world's first machine-actionable corpus of handwritten Cherokee might enable. Um, once we get a corpus that's trans, uh, translated, transcribed into Unicode code points, we then have, of course, a data set that can be used to answer corpus linguistic questions. And that's really important for native studies in the United States. Moving beyond questions of corpus linguistics, we might actually, by transcribing this Kilpatrick collection of Cherokee manuscripts, 
be a step down the road towards designing a handwriting recognizer for the Cherokee syllabary, at least as expressed through human handwriting. And the reason for this is because we'll have this enormous archive of ground truth, of hundreds if not thousands of pages, which will have been fully transcribed. We'll thus create a one-to-one -one correlation between a handwritten glyph on a piece of paper and a Unicode code point. As we all know through some of the recent advances in recognizing street numbers on houses in Google Street View, that what can be done nowadays with neural networks to train machines to understand strange letters or numbers, no matter how distorted the images are, is really quite incredible. So we see that as a possible further step for this transcription of Cherokee manuscripts. I want to move on to the question of having humans not just transcribe the text they see in front of themselves, but also understand and then represent the relationship between the material that they're seeing on the page. And I've sort of termed this semantic relationship extraction. And this idea is not new. It's something that's been going on for a long time in the domain of citizen science. So if you remember some of the projects like the uh, old weather, which was looking at ship's logs to determine how, because captains kept very good records of how the wind was blowing and what temperature it was and what the barometric pressure was. Even hundreds of years ago, this is this amazing archive of, client science, of, of climate science. What we want to do is to push this towards the humanities. So what we've done is we've, we're working on a, what's called the Scribe API engine, which is a joint venture between Zooniverse, the citizen science organization, and the New York Public Library Labs, which has an enormous footprint in kind of digital humanities in the library. And what we want to do is we want to help people create an archive of theatrical history in New Haven by not just transcribing, but annotating an archive of theatrical programs from the Yale School of Drama and the professional theater company in New Haven, the Yale Repertory Theater. This is an early uh, design for the eventual site. And you can see some of the theatrical programs on the screen that you would have gotten when you walked into a theater in the 1920s. What I want to focus on is the ways we can have users who are looking at these theatrical programs help us figure out exactly who the people are and what their roles are. And this means not just running this through OCR, which would give us an undistinguished mass of text, but rather having humans draw boxes around the words Twelfth Night and declare that to be the, the title of the play draw a box around William Shakespeare and have that declared to be the playwright. In a second stage, users would go through and transcribe what's been uh, identified as the author of a play, in this case Moliere. Or more compellingly, they would describe the relationship between a character, Mrs. Vivaldi in this case, and the actor who played her, Mary Jane Childs. So if you imagine this being done on, with every single actor and character on this page, and then you imagine that being done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times, what you might end up with is a kind of linked data set of theatrical history in New Haven. So let me show you one view of what that might look like. Here we have a play called Winter's Tale, and we have all the actors who played in Winter's Tale. We have a, a play called A Streetcar Named Desire, um, including an actor who also starred in uh, Romeo and Juliet. What this essentially is a network graph of theatrical history. And as exciting as it is to have all of this for the history of New Haven theater since the 1920s, it becomes even more exciting when we think about putting this in conversation with other theatrical data sets. For example, from the New York Public Library, which pioneered this type of software. We know that historically there have been strong links between theater in New Haven, in Connecticut, and theater in Broadway in New York City. And creating this linked theatrical data set is one step to more precisely understanding these links. Again, uncovered from a special collection, but only possible because humans go through and define the relationships between the people and the actors and the roles. Now I want to step away from special and rare collections for a moment and turn towards a very different type of data, vendor data, and the importance in uh, most research libraries of ensuring researcher access to text and data mining approaches even when the raw material in question falls under a lot of different types of restrictions. There are, of course, enormous opportunities that make vendor data really exciting to text and data miners. For example, the fact that it's pre-digitized. You don't have to scan it inside the library. It comes as a digital product. And in fact, what we've found in working with vendors is that oftentimes the markup and or the metadata surrounding these collections is extraordinarily high quality and it exceeds that which we might do internally for a project. 
So we have this very tempting opportunity to work with vendor data. The challenge, of course, uh, can be summed up with two words, copyright and licensing. Um, I speak from a North American perspective where uh, most, most people regard 1923 as the big cutoff date, but even if the material were out of copyright, the vendors could still have a defensible claim that they had digitized the pre-1923 material and they had created metadata and markup on those materials. So what I want to do now is talk about a case study of a project we've been working on in the Digital Humanities Lab. I'm going to talk about text mining and image analysis in a collection that is very much under copyright and very much under license, and that's ProQuest Vogue Archive. So the American fashion magazine Vogue was first published in 1892. It's been published uh, almost 3,000 times over the history of its life. It used to be uh, published every week, then every two weeks. Now it's a monthly. You might buy on the newsstand. If you do the math and add all this up, you end up with about 400,000 pages of this fashion magazine. Now that's a lot to read through. We do have two or three full runs of Vogue fashion magazine in Yale Library. One's in our arts library, one's in our storage warehouse. So if you want to, you could read 400,000 pages. But we were interested in a different approach, a text and data mining approach. So we worked with ProQuest, which is the company that scanned the Vogue archive for Condé Nast, a copyright holder. And we worked to uh, gain access to the raw data. Uh, this ends up being about six terabytes of scanned images and OCR text. There are some really interesting technical aspects of this, including the fact that humans determined article segmentation of the magazine, which means that we have semantic units of articles, not just random pages. Of course, the challenge before we could do anything done with Vogue, we knew we were going to have to meet the challenge of copyright and licensing restrictions and designing TDM, a CDM system that would respect both copyright and licensing. So here's what we're working on provisionally as one possible model for TDM on restricted collections. We have a server that I'm going to show you in a minute, which is a public-facing web server. Anybody can uh, view this page on the Yale Library website. And what our, our project website stores is, it stores essentially permalinks to the full articles on the vendor system, on the ProQuest system. In addition to the technical permalinks, it also stores sort of like MLA citations. It stores um, the ways you might quote or cite an article down to the article level with the author and the page number. And so we're basically storing this metadata and permalinks to go back to the vendor's system of record. The other thing we're storing is we're storing what we call dimensionality reductions of this enormous 6 terabyte, 400,000 page archive. I'll show you some of these dimensionality reductions in a moment, but they include things like how often does a word occur over time, or how often is a particular uh, color like red expressed in a cover. However, what we're not storing is the full text of Vogue. That's under copyright and under license, and we're not storing high resolution images. And although you can look at our public-facing website and look at some of the TDM exploration, some of the data mining, if you try to click through to look at an individual article or an individual cover, to do that close reading, to move from the macroscopic view to the close reading view, the links will only resolve if your institution subscribes to the ProQuest Vogue archive. So I want to tell you two examples of how we uh, deploy text and data mining on this restricted archive. I'm going to show you two approaches in text mining, one of the one which I'm sure many people in this room will have heard of, Ngram search. We all remember Google Books Ngram search from about 2010. And that's a great example of a model where you try to look for a word or a set of words that you believe are going to be meaningful in the corpus, leveraging your own domain expertise about American fashion, for example. But I'm also going to show you a different technique, topic modeling. And this relies a little bit more on latent patterns within the archive. In a sense, you give up a little bit of agency and ask the data to organize itself. Let's turn to those both briefly. So here we see an n-gram search, a term frequency search, a relative term frequency search over Vogue from 1892 to the present day. This is authored in Bookworm, which is an open source n-gram tool developed by some of the same people who were involved in the Google Books n-gram tool. You can think of Bookworm as a kind of bring your own books approach to the n-gram. We brought the Vogue corpus to this. So what we're seeing here is um, a visualization of two uh, terms in the corpus. There are two collective nouns for women. The blue line is the word women, and the orange line is the word girls. And again, these are relative frequency every year. 
So there are two things people usually point out. One is that around 1970, there's a huge divergence. People start using the word women a lot more, and they stop using the word girls. Now, if you look at the time here, this is in the 1970s. It's underneath the editorship of Grace Mirabella, who self-identifies as a feminist. So what we're probably seeing here is a macroscopic, zoomed-out view of the loss of utility of the word girls in the 1970s as a term for women over 13. There's also a pattern which I think is just as interesting, which is the sudden rise in girls around 1915 to mean seemingly about to occur in the same frequency, and thus our hypothesis would be that it starts to become slang for women around 1915. Now, if I had a question about any of this, if I said, let me examine some of these early uses of the word girls, because I want to do my close reading and see if that's my hypothesis, that these are mostly young girls. Um, I can click on this year, and I will get the permalinks to these articles or advertisements. And in fact, you can just tell by some of the articles, fashion, smart fashions for girls and boys, these actually are articles about women under the age of 13. If I were on a network which subscribed to the ProQuest of the Archive, I could actually click and go directly to that article. But in order to respect copyright, I won't do that. Um, I'll also just show you that I could add in another word, like let's say I wanted to look at ladies versus girls versus women, so I can add that in. And you'll see it's relatively performant. So we're now able to see that ladies peaks around 1910 and undergoes a, a kind of long decline. And this works for all sorts of things. So if you're like me and you're really into fur, you can look at words like mink and maybe let's add in fox. And let's see how mink versus fox do over time. And it turns out people were really into mink in the 1950s. There's kind of this mid-century explosion in mink. So we can click through and look at all those ads and articles, but instead what I want to do is to show you a little bit more robust system for thinking about term frequency. Um, and what I'm going to show you here is a sort of a three-dimensional model of the word mink over time. So this is all still based on the bookworm uh, engine, but it's based on a new um, uh, prototype that uh, Ben Schmidt developed. What we're seeing here is still, we're still seeing time on the x-axis. We're starting in 1892 on the far left, and we're going to 2012 or something on the bottom right. But on the y-axis, on up and down, we're now looking at months. So we have 12 levels of granularity on the y-axis. And instead of a line that goes up and down, is we're do, building a heat map. So when the word mink is really in use, it turns more red or more orange. And so what you can see is not only is there a mid-century explosion in interest in mink, but it gets, starts getting advertised in the fall. And in fact, there's even sort of a trend line where people try to advertise mink in July, then the next couple of years they do it in August, and eventually they realize that we should be advertising mink in October. That's the right time to get people to buy mink. So again, some of the hidden patterns that are there when we just look for words that we think are there. However, the limitation of this is, of course, I would have to think about every word for fur, right? And I'd have to think, is shearling a good word to look for? Um, I'd have to think about what are other synonyms for ladies and girls and women? Um, so one, another way of thinking about text mining is to let data organize itself. And a common technique for doing this is topic modeling, an approach that some of you may be familiar with. Topic modeling is an extraordinarily complex mathematical concept for a humanities person like myself to try to explain. So what I'll just say is that it looks for patterns of term co-occurrence. We asked a topic model algorithm for 20 themes or discourses in the entire run of Vogue, about 100,000 articles all told. And this is some of the results. So one that I'm going to show you early is a topic that we're calling dressmaking. It's on the screen here. And the words that are characteristic of dressmaking are words like pattern, coat, cut, waist, sense, material, sizes, yards, inches. These are the terms that are characteristic of the topic, although it's important to say this is not just these words. This dressmaking theme is expressed as a probability distribution over the entire, every single unique word in the corpus. And what we've done down here on the graph is measure the number of articles which express a saturation, which are highly saturated for this dressmaking topic. And you can see how dressmaking declines after the Second World War. American women stopped making their own clothes, generally after the 1940s. But in the 1900s, the first half of the century, they did. Another one I can show you, which shows you the opposite trend line, is one that we're calling women's health. And this topic is expressed in, women like ex in words like women, health, body, exercise, doctor, medical, cancer. And it includes bigrams, or two words, like breast cancer, health and fitness, plastic surgeon. 
And if you look at the distribution of this theme or this topic over time, you can see it really peaks under Grace Mirabella. Grace Mirabella was married to a physician and tried to turn Vogue into the, a magazine that covered more of the concerns of everyday women. And indeed, if I look at some of the articles which are highly saturated for this theme, for this discourse, you can see um, various articles emerge um, that have to do with uh, body fat, with exercise, with contraception, with the dangers of smoking, um, uh, patients of cancer, um, trends in psychiatry, um, the strong midriff. So what we're essentially seeing is a, a kind of virtual subject catalog emerge out of doing uh, topic modeling on this corpus. We wouldn't necessarily have thought to look for words like cancer or smoking or um, co contraception in the corpus, but it does naturally emerge as a theme. Next, I want to conclude by talking about approaches to moving beyond text and to thinking about the visual material that is in a magazine like Vogue, or indeed could be in many collections, both vendor digitized as well as special and rare collections. So I mentioned before there are about 2,798 covers of Vogue magazine, because there's that many issues. Um, Vogue is an amazing repository of visual culture. Uh, Annie Leibovitz has shot covers for that magazine. Um, some of the covers were drawn by Salvador Dali. It's got an amazing collection of visual culture, not just on the covers, but in the fashion photography inside. And yet the challenge is um, all of these covers are, of course, under copyright. Annie Leibovitz's pictures are under copyright. We're licensed only for the use. in a Vogue cover can't be redistributed. Um, and so, of course, are some of the things even going back into the 40s. So the challenge is how can we, without just sort of slavishly reproducing the visual richness of the Vogue covers, how can we analyze this material and transform it in some way and get this macroscopic view of the visual richness of Vogue? So let me show you some experiments we've been doing. This visualization here is taken from a, an approach pioneered by Lev Manovich and his student Damon Crockett at the Software Studies Lab, both at the University of California, San Diego, and the City University of New York. What this is is all the covers from about 1901, which was when we first start to see color reliably in Vogue. We take each of those covers and we cut them into 100 slices. And we end up with about 280,000 pieces of Vogue covers each of which can be then measured for its hue, its color value, as well as its brightness if it's light or dark. Now, let me zoom in on this a little bit. As you can see, these are teeny slices of covers, as if I took each cover and cut it into 100 pieces. And we've then arrayed them on a line going basically from yellow, and there's a teeny bit of green, and then we go into blue, and then we go into red. So that's the macroscopic view of about 280,000 slices of the cover of Vogue. And this is sort of zooming in so you can see that these are teeny snippets of the covers themselves. So this is a way of kind of getting at a visual fingerprint for the, all of the covers that Vogue has ever done since they started producing um, color imagery. Now in this particular visualization, I've collapsed every single year from 1901 to 2011 into one image to get a fingerprint of the entire collection at once. But I could also keep all of these years separate and try to see how the visual fingerprint of the covers of Vogue changes every year. So that's what I'm going to show you here. What we're seeing here is we're going through the teens. Pretty soon we're going to hit the 20s. The X is saturation. So stuff on the left is not very colorful, but stuff on the right is, is more colorful. And as we go into the 40s and 50s, you're seeing more color emerge. And when you get into the 70s, color gamuts increase. You start getting greens and yellows and things like that. And we can take a look at any one of these years and see how that visual fingerprint represents the very the sort of slices that are drawn from the covers. 
So this is basically taking all of these covers, chopping them into pieces, and then thinking about each year as a kind of slice of time expressed in two color dimensions of saturation and of brightness. Again, there are many corpora for which this could be an, a, a technique. We just wanted to do this on Vogue covers because covers have this kind of indexical relationship to the magazine. It's what you see on the newsstand that entices you to buy it. It's the first thing you see when it comes through the mailbox. So in conclusion, in these couple examples that I've shown today, I've tried to focus on how digital humanities can be done inside the library and how DH done in the library can represent the values of the library. We've talked about some of the opportunities that are there for digital humanities projects on both special and rare collections, as well as vendor digitized material that comes to us already as digital files and oftentimes includes very competent markup. And we've also talked a little bit about how digital humanities can fulfill the objectives of many research libraries by capturing the attention and using the domain expertise of speakers of languages or people who care about theatrical history to actually fold back metadata into the archives themselves, to enable corpus linguistics techniques on rare materials, to be able to expose open linked data in the form of a database of who acted in which plays. We also talked about the importance of securing the rights of scholars to perform text and data mining on licensed digital materials, materials which are taking up an ever greater portion of our collection development budgets. Thanks very much for your attention. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thank you so much for this, this very impressive talk. I'm sure there are many questions. Thank you very much. Um, I was thinking at, at the beginning of your talk about the word lab and that this seems to be popping up in a bit of a trendy term, but I was glad to hear you mention experiment, and I was wondering if you see it as a change from researchers coming to the library archives and doing their research on their own to collaborating with them and doing experiments where you provide some of the tools as well as the content. That's a great question. I think there's much to be gained by research libraries extending their reach further into the research life cycle, um, not just stopping when the books leave the library. Um, we know that researchers depend upon subject specialists to find physical materials. Increasingly, in my library, they're depending on subject specialists to be made aware of the uh, licensed electronic resources we have. And so part of what we're trying to do is to say, well, in addition to telling people that there is this new license database that we have, if, that, if we have the ability to get the raw data from that database, then perhaps the researcher could ask dis different questions because he or she would no longer be limited by the vendor's generic search interface. Might be able to subject a particular database that he or she cares about that a subject librarian told them about to the types of analysis that we've shown here today. We chose the word lab uh, specifically because we were excited by what the word lab meant and the sort of values that it invoked. So in the hard sciences, um, everybody, my sister is an animal behaviorist, she works in a lab. She has a whole team supporting her. Um, in the humanities, at least in my country, we are more solitary. And we don't have statisticians and research scientists and postdocs helping us. So one idea of the digital humanities lab is that it's a place, a shared lab for the humanities, including expertise from programmers and designers and librarians, where humanities faculty and humanities graduate students can meet and use um, equipment, get access to data, and gain training in these types of skills. So th those values of the word lab are very much uh, what we aspire to. Kristina Hormia from Finland, National Library and Ann Libe. Thank you very much for this uh, fascinating presentation. Uh, first, I'd like to give you a little background and then I ask a question. So in Finland, we, we have a national discovery portal covering metadata from libraries, archives, and museums. It's an open source, so it's sort of quite freely accessible. It, it has an, an open API. In addition to that, we have a national ontology service, also open source, open APIs, uh, in, in three languages, mostly at the moment. 
and now we have integrated these two. So when librarians are describing content and they use this uh, ontology service, they can see how these concepts or terms have been used in the National Discovery Portal. And, and this uh, brings me to my question. So have you thought or are you perhaps using ontologies really to, to sort of search the, the concepts or words within yeah. this uh, mass of data? Right. Or could, could you see some possibilities in this? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Um, I think certainly the scope and scale of large amounts of digital data can challenge some historical models of how we describe content. Sometimes stuff is overwhelming. Um, and so I think the interesting question from a machine learning point of view is how to leverage the power of uh, latent signal in a, in a large corpus, how to use techniques, um, whether it's clustering, classification, topic modeling, uh, word embedding models, while not losing the expertise of librarians, catalogers, archivists, and their scholarly ontologies or their disciplinary ontologies, which are meaningful. Um, I think that uh, sometimes we confront archives which, are, which seem to be too large to ever be uh, effectively described by human effort, but I don't think they're too large to be described by humans um, if they have the service of machine learning and computational uh, forces behind them. So I think some of the most exciting uh, efforts in the digital humanities that I know of are trying to unify uh, di disciplinary expertise, domain expertise, uh, ontologies which have proven useful for decades, if not centuries, with the computational power of, um, of raw data analysis in order to produce archives which are legible and meaningful to scholars. Peter, that was a, a wonderful talk. And I was thinking about something that's been on my mind for a while, and I think that you've, you've turned the corner on it. And I wonder if it's something you can help us all with. Because it seems to me that the vendors that own the copyright to the raw data have put a lot of work into that. Mm -hmm. And they need to be remunerated for that. But scholars need to be able to read. They need, the freedom to read, I think, is something that we have to protect. So what you're saying is, in order to read things today, we're going to need tools for distant reading. And if I'm a scholar, I want to control how I read, right? That's, that's my job. The vendor may produce the raw material, but I want to be able to read it the way I need to read it. So I'm wondering, I'm trying to think about how we can all sort of throughout the world make it possible that scholars get to read on their own terms. Yeah. And I wonder if that's a way into this conundrum of how we deal in this open access world. And it isn't a powerful argument mm -hmm. that we could all use. Because what you've shown us is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, from the Cherokee stuff to the Vogue mm -hmm. stuff to everything in between. Mm -hmm. And it's based on the ingenuity of of brilliant scholars at places like Yale and Oklahoma and Iowa. Um, do you, I, I don't know if this is a question. It's almost something to throw out to everyone to think about. But if, if you could, uh, or Wolfram, also speculate on this, because I know Göttingen is doing some of the same kind of work. I know Jeremy Upton's here at Edinburgh. He's also doing that kind of work. So just uh, something to throw out for, all, for us all to think about. Well, it's a great question. I, you know, what I usually say is that no publisher follows our professors out of the library and tells them to stop reading this chapter so quickly and please don't skip ahead in this print book. Uh, we want the same control over the licensed electronic resources. We're going to be able to read it however we want. I think vendors are building easy to use text and data mining portals, which will take care of the intro 101 digital humanities classes and will take care of a lot of um, initial work. But you're right that only by gaining complete access to the raw data do you have control over the entire research uh, pipeline. And you have reproducibility, and you have the ability to know exactly what you do. Um, so yeah, that would be my perspective on it. Could I add one, yeah. one thing to that? I want to read Vogue, and I want to read 16 other things at the right. same time. So right. even if my vendor does that for me, I have no interest in that. Yeah. unless I can put it together with other pieces. That's right. And God forbid if one fashion magazine comes from one vendor which makes one defensible set of choices about stop words and the other vendor makes a different choice, then you have a problem. I cannot give an answer, but I would like to um, actually 
ask a similar question. What can digital humanities do to improve our library systems? That's a great question. Well, I think there are enormous areas of overlap, and we see this already in um, recommendation um, engines, things that are trying to surface other content within big digital library systems. That's an area of research that I think a lot of digital humanists find very um, productive. Certainly information schools deal in the intersection between both. What I was showing a little bit of in the transcription and in the semantic entity extraction are some hypothetical experiments that could be built on top of not every rare books collection, not every special collection, but on some targeted ones to see if it's worth the, the effort. Um, what we do in the lab, this goes back to the question of the lab, is we're not sort of 24-7 production systems, we're not library IT, we build these experimental systems and that gives us freedom to try new things. Um, I, my goal is to have eventually a lot of our experiments, if, they're, if they justify their time and their effort, migrate into being supported systems. In, in our case, this would mean pushing them to the Fedora Hydra Blacklight stack, but I'm sure there are other digital library systems there too. I think there's room for both edgy experimentation as well as moving some of the, the best practices and the successful experiments into digital library systems themselves so these stop being one-off kind of hothouse flowers and start delivering value um, across the entire digital library system. Further questions? Uh, David Prosser from Research Libraries UK. One of the things that we're always told about innovation is that um, you have to have the freedom to fail. Mm -hmm. um, but I often feel that in the public sector, in the university sector, where failure is, is, is frowned on, it's seen as wasting money and being um, um, uh, unproductive. Do you feel that you have the freedom to fail in, in, in some of the experiments that you're doing? Well, we're going to find out. Um, <laughs> I think, yeah, I think one of, the, um, one of the things that we wanted to do was to, in the lab, was to, first of all, hire new staff to not place additional burdens on our library IT group, which is an excellent group juggling a lot of balls. So what we want to do is to make targeted bets on reusable systems that we think have broad applicability across many collections. The Cherokee thing demos well, but we have thousands of archives in the Rare Books Library and other places that this could be put on top of. Um, the semantic extraction, we, you wouldn't believe how many semi-structured data things we have, um, catalogs of um, Babylonian you know, cuneiform shipped to and fro uh, during various parts of the 20th century, that this could potentially be transformative for. Um, because it's allowing humans who, are, who care about this material to uh, create kind of structured records as part of their normal research practices. Some of these are going to fail, um, and some of the software systems you may see today may never see the light of day as production systems. But what I would say is, um, if we, ne if we never end up using the Scripto Omega stack, which is what's behind the Cherokee transcription, what we will do, do is, in our production systems, what we will have is a body of knowledge about what works. How do we work with native communities? How do we ensure that they have a way of saying, um, this information I'm seeing on the screen is sensitive. How can I tell a librarian to pull it? Because I'm the only one who can read it, and I can tell you this shouldn't be online. Um, that's really more of a work processes and a best practices thing, which is completely orthogonal to what piece of code we deploy and what language we've written in. So I hope that um, some of the things we learn in our experiments is, oh boy, don't, don't try that software stack, try a different one. But the evergreen will be, here's how we worked around that problem, and here's how we work together with subject specialists, catalogers, archivists, and curators. Margo. Uh, is it on? So, Margot Baguer from the University of Göttingen. Um, I really love your question, David, because I, the, I had the same question in mind, because if I look at the possibilities of digital humanities and the actual questions that could be coming up, I'm seeing us in something like a long-term experiment that's probably like 10, 20 years from now on until it's going to be seen as a ripe technology and a ripe way of doing science. Do we have the right tools to teach patients to those that are not really on board yet? Mm -hmm. Well, I think one of the things your, your question raises for me is the question of, of, of graduate training in a research university. So um, I went through a literature program and we didn't get any quantitative or algorithmic training. Um, I think that's probably true of most departments at Yale and most literature departments in my country. 
So the question is, how do we teach digital humanities skills? Maybe we could make this question both about librarians who want to add more skills to what they already know in the quantitative space, as well as graduate students in the humanities who want to work with libraries or digital humanities support centers. One of the challenges is if you think about this along the lines of how we try to teach foreign languages, at least in my country, we teach foreign languages for two years to undergraduates. You lose um, 60 to 80 percent of the uh, students after the first year. And even if they, you get students who stay through two years, um, the amount of people who actually can speak Italian after taking uh, a two years of Italian, if they try to get on a bus in Rome, it's basically zero percent. They don't know the dialect. They don't know anything. We somehow don't think of that as a failure. We don't think of that as uh, two years wasted. We think of it as broadening. We think, well, maybe there'll be a couple people who go on to become an Italian languages and literatures major. The question is, are we willing to accept that attrition rate in training uh, graduate students in the humanities in quantitative and algorithmic digital humanities skills? Um, are we willing to accept the notion of German for reading knowledge, right? You can't really speak it, but you can sort of decode it or read a paper in it, right? Um, I don't know yet. I spent my graduate career partially teaching undergraduate Swedish, and um, not all of them are fluent. But, so what would it mean if I tried to teach people for two years digital humanities methods and we had that same attrition rate? Uh, I think that's a question we have to confront. One very quick question. You have the privilege of the last, Christina. This is Christina Horme again. I have a very practical question. I'm interested about the funding of your lab. Sort of, you mentioned you have a certain number of staff. Yeah. Staff. So, what other kind of costs do you have? Do you have permanent funding, or is it based on projects? Right. Um, I think there's a lot of um, foundation support for digital humanities in America right now. Certainly, the Mellon Foundation has been very generous. Others as well. Our federal agency, the National Endowment for the Humanities, has made big commitments. Our particular lab is funded for the first three years by a private foundation. Uh, we have continuation funding lined up for our staff members. But you're right, part of my job will be to um, help people raise money for years for and beyond. Um, on the other hand, I guess that's something that's exciting to me, the notion of having to justify yourself every three years and think about, um, maybe we need two programmers now. Um, maybe we, we don't need me, we need somebody else who can program. 